Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenos días. Bienvenidos a nuestro primer seminario internacional del Instituto Nacional de Medicina Genómica en el año 2021. Hoy tenemos el gusto de presentar al doctor Gabriel Meloni, quien cursó sus estudios de pregrado en química en el Instituto Giamone en Italia. Obtuvo el grado de maestría en ciencias con especialidad en biotecnología en el Instituto de Fisiología General y Bioquímica de la Universidad de Milán y el grado doctor con la especialidad en química, bioinorgánica y bioquímica en el Departamento de Bioquímica de la Universidad de Zurich en Suiza. Ha realizado diversas estancias postdoctorales, dentro de las principales encontramos Departamento de Bioquímica de la Universidad de Zurich, Instituto Medical Hogak Sioux, del Instituto de Tecnología de California, el Centro de Biología Estructural de la Universidad de Argus en Dinamarca. Actualmente es profesor asistente de la Universidad de Texas en Dallas. Tiene diferentes líneas de investigación, dentro de las cuales podemos destacar el estudio de metal de metaloneuroquímica, del factor inhibidor del crecimiento neuronal, estructura y reactividad del clúster metal de alteolato, en metalotioninas, química bioinorgánica de metaloproteínas y péptidos implicados en trastornos neurodegenerativos, principios de selectividad y transporte de metales de transición en ATPASAS de tipo P1B. Ha recibido diversos reconocimientos, dentro de los cuales podemos destacar el NSF Career Award de la National Science Foundation en este año, eh, el Maximizing Investigator Award, eh, Research Award por eh, the National Institute of General Medical Science, el Marie Curie International, International Outgoing Fellowship Award de la European Commission y el Fellowship for Perspective Researchers de la eh, Sociedad de Suiza. El día de hoy nos presentará la conferencia titulada The Fascinating Chemistry of Transmembrane eh, Transition Metal Transport. Doctor Meloni, sea usted bienvenido. Muchas gracias por aceptar nuestra invitación. Thank you. First of all, uh, let me start by uh, thanking Dr. Arias and Dr. Arcos for the kind invitation to present at the Instituto Nacional de Medicina Genómica. Uh, it's a real great pleasure to be here. And uh, what I'm going to do today, uh, I would like to present you a couple of stories uh, related to the research that we conduct uh, in our laboratory here at the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, my laboratory, in my laboratory, we are very much interested in studying the roles of transition metals in living organism, in particular, the chemistry and biochemistry of transition metals in, in biology. And the reason why we are interested in studying transition metal is because if you look at the periodic table of elements and you think about living organism, you actually would think that living organism is the real of carbon-based compound. And that is actually true. You know, the large majority of biomolecules are made out of carbon-based compounds. But in reality, if you look in details, transition metals are actually present as essential trace elements in all living organisms. And when we talk about essential trace elements, we just need to look at the actual meaning of the word, the words. Essential uh, states for the fact that essentially all living organisms from the most simple ones, like for example, bacteria, to the most sophisticated one, like for example, uh, living organism like human beings that I, I like to think that we are very complicated, they are actually relying on transition metals to perform biochemical reaction and, and to actually guarantee that biochemical processes are working very well. On the other hand, the, these elements, these transition metals that are highlighted here in green are actually trace elements because if you compare the amounts of these elements compared to the bulk elements of life, they are present in much lower amount. And here, just to give you an, an explanation, is the chemical composition or elemental composition of a human body of 70 kilos. And you will see that obviously we are made out mostly of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. Obviously, hydrogen and oxygen are the big part because, because we are made mostly out of water. And if you compare the amounts of this element with the one of transition metal, you will see that transition metals are present in much lower amount. One of my favorite elements is copper, 
in the human body, we have around 100, 110 milligrams of copper. And it's a very tiny amount. If you actually go in a lab and put it in a tube, you will see that it's a very restricted amount. Nevertheless, this is essential. If we actually deviate from these amounts, we can actually develop very serious pathologies that can also be lethal. So why essential, uh, why transition metal are essential elements? They are essential because they play critical function uh, in three main different aspects of biochemical processes. They can play a structural function by stabilizing structure of proteins in our cells. Uh, they are very essential in a number of enzymes as catalytic cofactors for catalyzing reaction that uh, can be catalyzed by specific enzyme. It's becoming more and more evident that some of them, they are also playing signaling role in the cells, in particular in higher eukaryotes and in, in sophisticated organs like the brain, where basically you can imagine that zinc and copper, they are working as what you would think about calcium signaling. So metals can also play a role as a signaling ion. Um, the question that you might have is, why biology needs to rely on transition metals. And the reason is uh, that I like to think about is a chemical reason. If you look at the electronic structure of transition metals, they actually contain uh, partially filled or completely filled the orbitals. So it means that they are very well suited to perform reactions. For example, redox reaction, oxygen activation, oxygen binding, all electron transfer, so they can perform reaction that typically carbon-based compounds cannot perform uh, well or cannot perform at all. And it turns out that a lot of biochemical processes are actually requiring metals to, to take place. Um, think about mitochondrial respiration for the ATP generation. All um, the, or a large part of, of the enzymes in the mitochondrial respiratory chain, they actually contain metals as cofactor for electron transfer or think about hemoglobin in your blood for transporting oxygen. So it means that the chemistry of transition metals is critical for performing biochemical function that otherwise they could not be carried out very efficiently. There is a drawback though for that particular ability of catalyzing reaction is that if this reactivity is not tightly controlled, what it can happen is that metals becomes from essential they are basically turning into toxic elements and they can play very detrimental toxic function in the cells. For this specific region, the reason um, evolution evolved a very sophistica sophisticated set of biomolecules, in particular protein, to handle transition metal homeostasis such a way that their reactivity is controlled and only the reaction that we want to have in a cell are taking place. So obviously we are not going into the details of this scheme, but what you will see is that in all living organisms, you will have a series of proteins that are responsible for controlling the homeostasis of transition metals in the cells. You will have proteins that are transmembrane proteins that are sitting in the membrane of each cell that regulates the flux of metals from outside to inside the cells or from inside the cells to outside the cells. Then you will have chaperone, uh, metallochaperone molecules that will be able to actually pick up the metal from the transporter and deliver it to the target enzyme. You will have storage proteins that are basically storing transition metal within the cell and delivering them when there is the need for from the cell to have uh, metals um, uh, delivered to specific targets. And as well, you will have uh, metal dependent transcription factor that are capable of sensing metal concentration within the cells and induce transcription of specific genes as a function of the metal levels present in the cells. So it's a very sophisticated network of proteins that are involved in guaranteeing that the metals are going in the right place at the right time and avoid that you have these homeostasis that would catalyze, for example, with redox active metal, the production of reactive oxygen species that would be very detriment detrimental for uh, cell survival. In our lab, we are very much interested in studying um, several classes of metal transporters to try to understand the principle of metal recognition and translocation across the lipid bilayer. Because if you will, this class of proteins are the main gatekeeper controlling the flux of metals from outside to inside the cells. 
Moreover, due to the challenges that are inherent to the study of transmembrane protein, because they are hydrophobic protein embedding a lipid bilayer, we are missing a lot of information on the really molecular processes that are regulating the metal flux by these transporters, simply because they are very challenging target to study biochemically and structurally. My lab, we also are interested in studying several other classes of protein that are involved in metal dependent transcription and as well in uh, metal detoxification. And this basically brings me to this uh, overview of the type of or the areas uh, of investigation in which we are involved in our, in our research. A uh, large part of my group is dedicated to study the mechanism of selectivity and the chemistry and the transfer mechanism of different classes of metal transporters. But then we also have efforts in trying to identify and characterize new metal transporters that they have biomedical relevance, either for example, as virus, virus factors in pathogens or in processes related to multi-drug resistance. And also we have uh, areas that I would not talk about today uh, related to the study of soluble proteins that are cytosolic proteins that are involved in metal storage uh, their reactivity to all metal-based metal -based drugs, and as well, we are interested in studying uh, the roles of metal in the neurochemistry in the central nervous system. In the talk of today, I would like to actually present you two stories um, that are related to transmembrane metal transporters, and they are essentially two different stories. One that is more uh, a structural and chemical approach to identify and investigate the principles of metal selectivity in transmembrane metal pumps. And the second part of the talk instead will present you with the identification and characterization of novel iron transporters that are important for uh, bacterial pathogenic virulence. So let's start from, from the basic question that we are trying to address in, in, in some of our project. We are very much interested in studying how selectivity is actually achieved for specific metal in primary active metal pumps. And this is because uh, is actually a very complex chemical problem. So you have a transmembrane protein that is sitting in the lipid bilayer. And in the case of a primary active pump, they have to be capable of recognizing selectively a specific transition metal. And after they are recognized this metal, they have to be translocated across a hydrophobic lipid bilayer and in the case of primary active pump at the expense of a source of energy that is in this particular case, ATP hydrolysis. If we think about selectivity in metal transporters, obviously, and you look it from the chemical point of view, you cannot just simply rely on the Irving Williams series with no steric selection for inorganic ligands because this order of affinity will, will be always followed. So you will never be able to obtain if you don't have steric selection, a transporter that is selective, for example, for iron over copper, because copper will always be bound with a higher affinity. Obviously, we know that in proteins, due to the fact that we can select in the protein structure a specific coordination geometry and a specific set of donor ligands, we can actually impart a bias in metal selectivity. And what we know from soluble proteins, cytosolic proteins, is that the thermodynamic stability is what is dominating the selection and transfer of metal from a donor to an acceptor in, sol in, in, an acceptor in soluble proteins. Uh, but in metal pumps or in metal transporters, this is, this is actually more complex because not only you need to have a thermodynamic selection, but you need as well to have kinetic lability because a transporter needs to be able to bind the metal selectively, but is it needs to be able as well to translocate it very rapidly across the lipid bilayer because if you just bind it, but you cannot release it anymore, you end up not having a transporter, but just having a metal binding protein. So what we are trying to understand here is how selectivity and kinetic lability can be achieved in metal transporters. And we selected a large class of protein called P-type ATPases that are ion pumps, simply because within this large family of pumps that are preserved in several uh, living organisms, you have members that are specifically selective almost for every single transition metals that is an essential trace element in the cells. And as well, you have members that are selective for toxic metals and these transporters are involved in detoxifying these metals outside from the cell by pumping them out from the cells. Uh, 
So it's a very nice class of protein to study because you have a same, the same general topological features that results though in adaptation of specific coordination feature that allow a specific pump to be selective for a specific metal. So if we understand how this is taking place at the molecular level, we really address the principle of selectivity of metal uh, translocation in primary active pump. So what is this class of P-type ATPase pumps that I just mentioned? So they are primary active transporters. It means that they are capable of translocating a specific ion from one side to the other of the, uh, to the other side of the membrane, from one side to the other of the membrane at the expense of ATP hydrolysis to generate ADP and inorganic phosphate. And sometimes this is coupled to counter transport of a different ion species in the opposite direction. They are called P-types because through their catalytic cycle, they can form a covalent aspartyl phosphate intermediate at a conserved aspartic residues that is present in all the members of the superfamily. It's a very large class of protein and they have a very large uh, diversity in terms of selectivity for the species that are translocated. So they can go from earth metals and uh, earth alkaline metals up to transition metals and even phospholipids. So you have different types with different selectivity. And what we are focusing now today is this class called P1B type ATPases because those are involved in translocation of transition metals. How do they work? How can they perform this translocation function? They follow the so-called post-alber catalytic cycles in which you can imagine that the protein can actually interconvert into two different conformational states that are open to the opposite side of the membrane. So you have a so-called E1 state open towards the cytosol. This particular inward state is capable of recognizing the cargo, in this particular case, the metal, and upon binding, ATP hydrolysis can take place. The metal can be occluded into the membrane and structural conversion, conformational change result in the formation of the so-called E2 state that is open to the opposite side of the membrane, resulting in metal release and eventual counter transport of a different type of ions in the opposite direction. So here is a scheme presenting what I just discussed. You have a transmembrane por portion that is deeply embedded in the lipid bilayer that is responsible for recognizing the metal and binding, in, binding it deep in the membrane. And then you have three soluble domains called N, P, and A. N is where ATP is binding. When the metal is binding in the transmembrane region and ATP is binding to the N domain, ATP hydrolysis can take place. So the P domain gets phosphorylated in the conserved aspartate residues. This uh, reaction triggers a conformational change that results in the formation of the E1P state, that is the phosphorylated state of the protein, in which the ion is occluded in the membrane and can then interconvert into the opposite uh, uh, conformation called E2P that is open to the opposite side of the membrane. This has a lower affinity for the metal. The metal can be released. And after that is taking place, ATP, the, sorry, the phosphate that was bound to the aspartate can be hydrolyzed, inorganic phosphate can be released, and the protein can revert back into the original E1 state. So you have a sort of alternating access mechanism that allow the pump to translocate the cargo. This is actually, we know it well uh, from structural studies that have been conducted in the on the calcium pump from the endoplasmatic reticulum. I have been lucky to be postdocing in the lab of uh, Professor Nissen in Denmark that has been pioneering this study and has been able to solve essentially several structure of the calcium pump in the different intermediate state of the catalytic cycle. And this movie that is presenting here is actually a morph uh, across different structurally determined X-ray crystal structure of different intermediates of the catalytic cycle that actually really show how this particular pump is working really as a nano machine. What you will see is that you have this transmembrane portion over here. Here you have the nucleotide binding domain where ATP is binding. When binding is taking place, structural rearrangement allows phosphorylation in this blue domain. Then you have an actuator domain that is actually translating conformational changes from the soluble domain into the transmembrane helices, such a way that the membrane helices are actually changing in their tilting such a way that the ions, in this particular case calcium, can be bound 
occluded and then released at the opposite side against an electrochemical gradient at the uh, expense of ATP hydrolysis. If you will, this is actually really working as a pump at the nanoscale. Uh, 100 <clears throat> kilodalton pump, thousands of atoms that are all working in a coordinated fashion to perform a catalytic function oops, of transport. And I apologize for this. Um, if we now go and look to the actual uh, P1B type uh, trans, trans, uh, transmembrane pump that are pumping metals, what you will see is that the overall topology is in a way similar to the, to the one of the calcium pump, despite we have additional transmembrane helices, additional uh, soluble metal binding domains. And what is, uh, has been uh, described in, in the past studies in the last 10 years is that within the P1B type family, we have different subfamilies that have different metal selectivity. This results in the classification of P1B1 pump that are selective for copper one, P1B2 pump that are selective for zinc, cadmium, and lead, and so on and so forth for other subclasses selective for cobalt, nickel, and iron. What it turns out that metal selectivity appears to be determined by the actual uh, ligands or specific motifs that you have in the transmembrane metal binding site specifically present in transmembrane four, five, and six. So if you go, for example, from a copper pump to a zinc pump, you will see that you have these motifs that are conserved, conserved within each subfamily, but are different across subfamily. So if you look the copper pump and the zinc pump, they have different motifs, and it appears that possibly ligands on these transmembrane four, five, and six are actually the one responsible for determining the coordination to the metals and selection to the metal. Um, we have been involved in actually studying these processes in the copper pump. And um, in the lab where I was postdoc in, the first structure of a copper pump was solved in the E2 state with the metal free, in a metal free state with no copper bound. Nevertheless, even if the substrate were not, was not bound, through a series of biochemical studies that we have conducted and as well X-ray absorption study, we have been able actually to nail down the process by which copper is translocated by the copper pump from one side to the opposite side of the membrane. Copper is a redox active metal, is bound in the cytosol to a copper chaperon. The copper chaperon is capable of docking on a platform at the interface between the membrane and the, uh, and the soluble uh, part of the protein and deliver the copper to the translocation site to actually bind it in a very specific fashion from an entry binding site to a high affinity binding site present deep in the membrane, where basically you have a trigonal primer coordination by two conserved cysteine from the CPC motive in transmembrane four, and the conserved metion that is present in transmembrane six. And if you remember from my previous slide, those were residues that are present in the signature motifs that are unique to copper pump. So, what we were able to determine is that we have a sulfur based translocation pathway in copper pumps that is actually controlled by a series of sulfur ligand exchanges present in specific residues along the translocation pathway of uh, the copper pump in the transmembrane region. Eventually, then the metal is released and the tracing bacterial system is actually picked up by an acceptor called CASF that basically allows the translocation of the copper metal without having any free copper ion that would be toxic for the cell present either in the intercellular or the extracellular space. So we know well how the copper pumps are actually selecting and translocated. And then we were just asking ourselves, well, if we then try to understand and reveal how the zinc pump are actually selecting specifically zinc and translocating it, then we can make a comparison between the two classes to really nail down what are the principles for selectivity in zinc pumps. So throughout the years we have done us and, and in collaboration with other groups uh, from, from Denmark, we have conducted characterization of several zinc pumps from different organisms. And what was known is that despite the topological framework is very similar to in zinc pump to the one of the copper pump, what it uh, was emerging is that in the transmembrane feature responsible for ion selection, the ligands, the proposed ligands are actually different between copper and zinc pump. In zinc pump, proposed ligands were two cysteine on transmembrane four, one lysine on transmembrane five, 
and the NAS Part 18 transmembrane 6. Um, I was involved, luckily enough, in the team that solved the structure, the first structure of a zinc P-type ATPases back in 2014, uh, and did the characterization of this pump from Shigella Sony. And there, uh, two structures were obtained, but unfortunately, these two structures were obtained in the so-called E2P and transition state of dephosphorylation. It means that these two structures correspond to the state in which the metal has been already released by the pump. So despite we can get information about the translocation mechanism, we really do not get from this structure what are the principles for coordination and selection of the metal. Nevertheless, by doing the comparison of the structure between the copper pump and zinc pump, we already revealed several differences in the way the two pumps work. First of all, if you look at the way the metal is uptaken in the transmembrane region, I told you before that in the copper pump, you have a chaperon that is basically docking, and this is basically just the pump, flip 90 degrees, look from the point of view of a chaperon. There is an electrostatic surface that is perfect to complementary over here uh, in the right panel in the copper pump. Th that electrostatic surface is perfectly complementary to the one of the chaperon. So the chaperon can dock on the copy protein, and then this methionine that is present in the transporter can actually kick in into the binding site of the chaperon, do a ligand substitution, and allow the metal transfer from the chaperon to the protein. If we actually look at the zinc pump, the actual electrostatic surface is completely different, and zinc pumps do not have a chaperon because zinc is not redox active, so it's present in the cell as low molecular weight complexes. Here we are having electronegative funnel with line aspartate and uh, negatively charged aspartate and glutamate residues that are basically generating an electronegative funnel that has just the function to basically direct the metal through a charge interaction to the metal binding site. If you look as well to the exit pathway in the opposite side of the membrane and you compare the zinc pump and the copper pump, you actually see as well that differences are present there. In the zinc pump, you have a wide open channel that is opening in the E2 state that basically allow the metal to go directly from the transmembrane metal binding site to be released to the opposite of the membrane. If you then compare the copper pump in the same state, there the exit pathway is much narrower and that pathway is lined with residues that basically perform a series of ligand exchange reaction such a way that the release of the metal is not just happening through a wide open channel. And this is that because you will have an acceptor chaperon on the opposite side that will allow the metal to be delivered to it without having any free metal released in the extracellular environment. Again, because copper is redox active and the cells cannot afford to have redox chemistry going on because this would result in radical production. So we already nailed down differences in the mechanism of uptake and release between the copper and zinc pump. But what about the selection of the metal? To address that, what we did, we selected a homolog uh, zinc pump called zinc NTA from Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And we selected that because it is highly conserved with all the other uh, zinc pump. Basically it has 40% identical and 30% similar amino acid compared to the structurally, so, the structurally determined zinc A from Shigella Sony and essentially 70% identical position in the transmembrane helices that are responsible for metal selection. Here you see the putative residues that were postulated to be binding the metal in the transmembrane region that are these two cysteine on transmembrane four, and then these aspartate and lysines present in transmembrane five and six. So what we went on doing, my students, Mark and, and Gordon, they basically went on and purify, express our protein in a recombinant system, uh, purify the membrane, extracted the membrane using a detergent, dissecting the protein from the membrane using a detergent and form so-called detergent membrane protein micelles that then can be used to purify through a series of uh, chromatography techniques that result in generation of a purified membrane solubilized uh, protein, in this particular case, zinc anti -A. But then what we can actually do, if we want to actually mimic the lipid bilayer environment, we can actually take the purified protein in the detergent micelles and generate artificial lipid bilayer of specific size that we control. And through a specific protocol, we are able to re-embed back 
our protein into the lipid bilayer. And then we can bind our substrate to generate the substrate binding form, both either as a detergent micelle complex or at, as a proteolyposome and perform characterization of those species to determine the nature of the metal binding site. So the protein can be expressed in high yield, can be purified at, our, at high purity, it can be essentially reconstituted back in proteoliposome with high efficiency or more close to 100%. Then what we can do, we can actually study the catalytic activity of the protein to check if the protein is indeed functional. And we can do that by studying the ATP hydrolysis rate as a function of substrate. If, since uh, substrate translocation and ATP hydrolysis are perfectly coupled in pump, you can only have ATP hydrolysis if the substrate is binding. So by doing this type of ATP, metal dependent ATPase activation, we can actually determine Michaelis maintenance type of parameters of the catalytic activity of the protein, both as a detergent micelle or when embedded in artificial lipid bilayer. We can determine maximum velocity and as well, we can determine upper end KM or Michaelis maintenance constant that in this particular case are in the range of 20 micromolar that is reasonable for the metal concentration that we are having in the cell. So, we can functionally reconstitute both the full length protein and as well the protein that lacks this heavy metal binding domain that is not essential for metal recognition that would simplify our uh, downstream spectroscopic investigation. If we look at the metal selectivity of the zinc pump, we were very pleased to discover that zinc pumps different than copper pump are actually much more promiscuous. So they can get activated not only by zinc, but as well by the other group 12 elements like cadmium and mercury, and as well by other soft metals like lead. So zinc pump, much more than copper pump, are promiscuous pumps. And the selectivity stems from this high affinity, high affinity transmembrane metal binding site, and is not given by any other metal binding element present in the protein. So the selectivity is given by the transmembrane region. So we were able to determine that we have one single metal binding site determined by both spectroscopic method and as well ICPNS method. Then we went on to actually apply XAFs and X-ray absorption study to try to determine what is the coordination environment in the transmembrane metal binding site for all the four different substrates. So if we now compare the analysis of this data, we can actually see that zinc is bound in a tetrahedrally, most likely distorted fashion by two sulfur that are actually two sulfur from the two conserved cysteine and two nitrogen oxygen. Cadmium is also bound as a, a tetrahedral uh, metal in a distorted fashion by both 2S to N coordination. But now if you look lead, actually lead is bound in a distorted trigonal pyramidal fashion with two sulfur ligand, but only one nitrogen oxygen, with definitely increase, significant increase bond length. And as well, mercury has a distorted digonal with uh, uh, long range interaction with two oxygen, with strong binding with two sulfur and weaker interaction with two nitrogen oxygen. So what you will see by looking at the diversity of the metal binding in terms of coordination geometry and as well differences in the bond length, we can actually conclude that the transmembrane metal binding site in zinc pump is much more plastic and promiscuous than the one of the copper pump. We went on ahead and as well compare the binding environment, both in detergent micelles and lipid bilayers, not going into the details here, but what we can conclude that the coordination that we observe in micelle is exactly the same that we observe in lipid bilayer, indicating that the structure of the metal binding site that we determine is conserved also in the native environment of the, of the uh, pump uh, in the memory of the cells. We were then through uh, mutational studies identified what are the ligands involved in coordination and indeed identified that, identified that the two cysteine and the aspartate are responsible for binding while the lysine is not and is actually acting as a built-in counter ion. So take a message of this is that the transmembrane metal binding site in zinc pump actually possess a so-called coordination plasticities that guarantees that the pump is a promiscuous pump that allow basically uh, substrate binding with different geometries and distances, but similar coordination properties. And this is actually relevant for the function of the pump because the pump is used by bacterial cell to detoxify the cells from toxic metals. So zinc, even if it is an essential metal, at increasing concentration is becoming toxic. 
as cadmium, lead, and mercury are as well toxic metals, but they are not essential. So the cells develop a pump that is basically promiscuous to recognize everything that has similar coordination properties that is toxic for the cell, such a way with, that with a single pump, detoxification can take place. So the overall conclusion of the study is that, first of all, if you look at the coordination environment, you need to have in a metal pump a coordination divergence from an ideal template, uh, like for example, a tetrahedral for a site, just because you need to have a pump that is still capable of binding the metal with high thermodynamic affinity, but the binding site should not be perfect and should be kinetically labile, such a way that the metal can be recognized, but as well can be released in the catalytic cycle. The other thing is that if you compare a metal pump to a classical ion channels, what you will see that the channels and pumps use a different ion selection principle. In one case, in the pumps, is really coordination chemistry that is determining uh, the selectivity towards a specific metal, while in the other case, selectivity is more a size type of selectivity that is guaranteed by the presence of selectivity filters that allow that the dehydration energy for a specific ion becomes uh, favorable upon coordination of these metals in the selectivity or this ion, the selectivity filters. So zinc pump and, and ion channels, they work, appear to work in a different way. There is an important point though. So all these structural studies are very nice, but unfortunately they are picture snapshot that are frozen in time in the analysis of these transporters. And there is another important point about metal pumps. And we know that from characterized, metal, uh, characterized pump that are not transition metal pump like the circle or sarcoendoplasmatic on calcium pump or the sodium potassium ATPAs in neuronal cells. We know that Translocation of one ion in one direction, let's say in the sodium potassium ATPase, results in the counter transport of a different ion that is in the sodium potassium ATPase, a potassium ion or two potassium ions, or in the, in the case of the circa pump are protons. So calcium is pumped in one direction and protons are pumped in the opposite direction. And depending on the stoichiometry by which ion and counter ion are translocated per each catalytic cycle, you might have a pump that is becoming either an electroneutral or an electrogenic pump because it can generate charge displacement across the lipid bilayer, bilayer that is acting as an insulator. So structure can give you information about the metal coordination in metal pumps, but cannot really tell you what is the mechanism of transport and if there is a counter ion transported because you don't see protons in crystal structure. Like in circa, you don't see the protons that are counter transported. So the question that you wanted to ask is that, are copper pump or zinc pump electrogenic or they are antiporters and they can counter transport protons as the calcium pump that has been characterized in advance? To actually address this, we have to develop a new strategy to study metal translocation in real time, a substrate translocation in real time. So we develop an assay in which basically we take our proteolycosome, 200 nanometer vesicles in which we re-embed back our purified protein. And we encapsulate in the proteolycosome lumen, a fluorescent probe that is a turn on probe that is giving a fluorescent signal when it's binding copper one. So what we can do, we can give the source of energy and the cofactor to bind ATP. And once ATP, magnesium and the substrate is present, metal can be translocated. And if that is the case, our turn on probe will now be able to detect translocation of proton and we can then monitor in real time copper one translocation and determine the kinetics of translocation of substrate in real time. If we want to know if protons are counter transported, we can encapsulate a pH dependent probe. So we do the same thing. We get the substrate, uh, the copper ion, we get the source of energy ATP. If protons are counter transported, what is going to happen is that proton will be pumped out, the pH will increase, and you will have a turn on signal of the pH indicator uh, that is basically acting as a probe or a reporter probe for real time changes of proton pump. We can also encapsulate a transmembrane potential probe. So if we transport copper and we don't have any counter transported ion, it means that we are transporting one plus charge per cycle. So the pump should, result, uh, should, should be electrogenic. Uh, 
If that is the case, we will be able to detect in real time the development of a transmembrane potential. My students, uh, Sam and Nishi, have been pioneering this method <clears throat> uh, and they have been able to demonstrate without going too much in detail by looking at the different channel, that is the copper channel, the proton channel and the transmembrane potential, potential channel, we discovered that camper pump differently than uh, calcium pump, they are electrogenic uniporters. They are pumping copper ion, they are not counter transporting proton and therefore they can generate an electrochemical potential during the transport catalytic cycle. This type of study is actually allowed to de determine mechanistic differences in the translocation mechanism of copper pumps compared, for example, to zinc pump and circa pump. We know that the copper pump basically is an electrogenic uniporter. There is no proton counter transport. Moreover, the release does not occur through a wide opening of the exit channel as is happening in the zinc pumps, but is happening through a narrow channel that basically differentiates significantly from the mechanism of transport of both the zinc pump and the calcium pump. Um, I like to present this because uh, this is the uh, artwork that my student Sam uh, generated by learning how to make very nice picture for journal cover. And I like to present it because he learned this by himself and basically generated this wonderful figure in, uh, in basically just two days overnight by learning how to use BioRender and other software. And I think it's a beautiful image and I like to acknowledge uh, the work of my students. Um, in the last 15 minutes or so, I want to move to a different story related to the characterization of iron transporters and their role in violence. Why we're interested in that? We're interested in the role of iron transporters in intracellular pathogens and uh, their role in replication. I want to give you here the example, the example of Mycobacterium tuberculosis in a collaborative work that we have done with the group of Marcus Seger in, in Switzerland. So Mycobacterium tuberculosis is the, the pathogen causing tuberculosis. And if you look in the replication cycle, you will see that is an obligate uh, internal intracellular pathogen in mammals. What is happening is that the intracellular replication of Mycobacterium tuberculosis is occurring in macrophages upon phagocytosis and replication into the phagosome of uh, the macrophage that is present in the host, in this case, a human uh, organism. And this basically allowed the pathogen to be engulfed in the phagosome, but uh, there are a series of effector systems that are encoded in the bacterial genome that allow the pathogen to evade the phagosomal maturation into a phagolysosome that would be responsible to destroy the cells as a response of our immune system. And the pathogen, by evading this phagosome maturation and phagolysosomal fusion, the pathogen will be able then to replicate inside the cells and then basically burst and infect nearby uh, macrophages and basically continue the infection. Turns out that pathogens, like all cells, requires iron for survival. And if you look in the catalytic cycle or replication cycle, it means that mycobacterium tuberculosis needs to be able to synthesize system that allow iron acquisition from the cytosol or from the host cell machinery because it's not exposed to extracellular environment. It means that it should be able to actually steal iron from the macrophages in our immune system. And how they do that? The large, the large majority of intracellular pathogens like mycobacterium tuberculosis or salmonella, salmonella, they are actually stealing iron by secreting small molecules called siderophores that are capable of being secreted outside the cell and be able to bind with very high affinity fer ferric iron, iron three, and then this complex that is formed between the siderophores and iron can be uptaken by cells by a series of siderophores, iron siderophores transporters. This allow, for example, in the case of mycobacterium tuberculosis, through the synthesis of these two siderophores called mycobactin and carboxymycobactin that are released through the inner membrane and then the outer membrane to steal ferric iron from the host cells and this prevent iron starvation and intracellular replication can then occur. In this collaborative work, 
we have been able, most of the transmembrane transporters involved in this process of iron siderophore uh, acquisition are actually not known or poorly characterized. In this collaborative work, we have been able to demonstrate that what was um, presumed to be uh, an orphan ABC transporters for which um, it was believed that uh, that particular ABC transporter was acting as an exporter for a substrate. It turns out that despite the topology fold of that transporter is the one of an exporter, in reality, this protein called um, IRT AB is actually a siderophore ferric iron complex importers that is capable of both recognizing the soluble version of mycobactin that is called carboxymycobactin, as well the membrane bound form called mycobactin siderophore in the iron bind form translocated to the membrane and that a soluble domain that is actually directly connected to the transmembrane ABC transporter called the seed domain is capable of reducing the ferric iron bound to the mycobactin to iron two from iron T to iron two, such a way that the affinity of the siderophore for iron two is much lower. Iron two can then be released by the high affinity siderophore that is binding iron three. And upon release, ferrous iron can be utilized by the cell for replication. So we discovered that essentially what was believed to be an ABC exporter is actually indeed an ABC transporter that is an importer for iron mycobactin complexes that allow ferric iron acquisition and reduction to ferrous iron to allow um, the mycobacterial cell to then not starve uh, because of lack of ferrous iron and continue the replication within the uh, phagosome inside the uh, macrophages. The last example that I want to give you is concerning a protein from Legionella pneumophila that is also a pathogen causing the Legionnaire's disease, is causing bacterial pneumonia. Uh, it was actually discovered after an outbreak in the American Legion in 1976. There are around 20,000 cases per year in the United States with a 10% risk of death. It can be treated with antibiotics, but right now, uh, a lot of patients, in particular immunocompromised patients or the one that have chronic lung disease, they are actually undergoing um, bacterial or, or antibiotic resistance, and they have a very poor prognosis. And this will result uh, in uh, approximately 2,000 deaths per year in the United States. Um, Leugenella pneumophila is also an intracellular pathogen. It replicates upon infection of a macrophages in a so-called Legionella containing vacuole that is basically generated by engulfing the Legionella cells into a membrane and it's, it's a host derived membrane from the plasma membrane of the macrophages. With this, this uh, Legionella containing vacuole, the Legionella can actually replicate and then infect the neighboring cells. There is a problem though that again, for replication, since the bacteria is actually engulfed in a specific vacuole, it needs to actually get nutrients from the host cells. And to do that, actually Legionella synthesize a protein called type four secretion system that allows the secretion of a number of effector molecules that are released in the host cytosol or are inserted in the actual Legionella containing vacuole membrane such a way that those effectors allow nutrient acquisition inside the vacuole, such a way that then uh, Legionella can replicate into the macrophage. So concerning iron it means that you need to have molecular processes that allow iron sequestration from the endogenous cell cytosolic pool, also called labile iron pool, that allow the transport of iron into the Legionella containing vacuole because differently than um, mycobacterium, the Legionella containing vacuole does not interact with the host endosome that are rich in ferric iron. So they cannot synthesize siderophores to actually get iron three and take it in. They need actually to rely on a system that is actually stealing iron from the cytosolic labile or iron pool that is actually present in the, in the form of ferrous iron and not ferric iron. It turns out that a um, few years ago, it was uh, a new gene was discovered called IROT that was uh, revealed to be 
an iron-dependent gene that is essential for Legionella pneumophila virulence. So if you knock out this gene, Legionella is not anymore capable of infecting and replicate macrophages. It was discovered that if you delete this gene, but you iron supplement the culture when you do your infection studies, you can actually rescue that intracellular growth defect that is related to the deletion of that uh, particular mutant. It was discovered that this protein was potentially a transmembrane protein important for iron acquisition in the Legionella containing micro. But the real molecular function and the subtype was not really known. So my student, Sam, uh, together with uh, an undergraduate student, Nathan, decided to undergo these studies and uh, tried to answer this question. Is IROT a novel transmembrane transporter that is responsible for final acquisition? And if it is the case, what is the substrate selectivity and what is the mechanism of transport? So we rely on the similar strategy that is, uh, as I just described before for the zinc pump. So we recombinantly express our protein, extract it from the membrane, generate protein detergent complexes, purified through a series of affinity uh, chromatography and size exclusion chromatography steps. And then we can also reconstitute it back in artificial lipid bilayer called proteoliposome. We characterize that the protein could be expressed in very high yield, could be reconstituted uh, back in artificial lipid bilayer with a very small dispersed size of approximately 200 nanometers. And we also, through sex mass analysis, revealed that IROT is a monomeric protein, so it's acting as a monomer. So Sam, what we decided to do is to verify in proteoliposome and study substrate translocation event in real time. So he generated this system of 200 nanometer vesicles containing approximately 100 molecules per vesicle in which he could encapsulate a fluorescent probe that is responding upon chelation is a turn-on fluorescent probe that is responding to chelation of different transition metals, such a way that we can follow by fluorescence the development of a fluorescent signal that is uh, indicative of translocation event in real time. So what you need to do, since not many iron true selective probes are available, you basically screen a series of probes and discover that the probe Fluozine 3 that was originally developed to uh, monitor zinc uh, fluxes can actually be used to monitor also other different transition metal ions belonging to the first row and as well some of the second row transition metal series. So after he discovered that he could use fluozine 3, then he went ahead, generated fluozine 3 encapsulated proteoliposome containing IROT in the lipid bilayer and performed met time dependent and metal concentration dependent uh, real time uh, kinetic translocation assays. And he was able by Michaelis Menten analysis revealed that indeed IROT is capable of translocating iron 2 with high efficiency with the Michaelis Menten in the low micro constant in the low micromolar range with a velocity of approximately 120 nanomole of iron per milligram of protein per second. Essentially saying that this indeed is a high effective, high capacity iron to ferrous iron transporters that is present in and encoded in the Legionella pneumophila genome. Uh, by doing this analysis, also was able to calculate that each IROT molecule is capable of translocating approximately two 10 uh, ferrous iron per second. And this basically give already an information about the modality by which the transporter is working. Because transporters that are undergoing conformational changes, like the pump, are actually translocating substrate in a kinetic that is much slower than channel or channel-like channel -like transporters. 10 to the 10 to the 4 ion per second for classical transporters, while 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8 ion per second uh, for classical channels and channel-like transporters. So what you could nail down that IOT translocation involves a transport mechanism that undergo conformational changes. So it means that IROT is a solid carrier-like transporter and not a channel-like facilitator. He also was able to study metal selectivity in the presence of a series of other essential transition metals. And he was able to actually show that IROT is indeed a high affinity, high, high selectivity uh, and high capacity iron-2 transporter that is very selective for iron-2 over other transition metal. 
and the oxidation state selectivity towards ferrous iron and the actual KM or binding affinity indeed strongly suggest that IOT is involved in uptaking iron from the labile iron pool present in the host cytosol that is having a KM of approximately uh, one to the five micromolar. Last thing he did, he also wanted to investigate the following. The Legionella containing vacuo is actually acidic. By being acidic, uh, we wonder if actually that acidity can actually be exploited as a driving force for catalyzing iron, tra iron, iron translocation by IOT. So what he did, he did the similar approach that we have described before for the copper pump. He encapsulated a fluorescent probe for protons or a pH dependent indicator in the proteoliposome lumen, and then exposed the liposome to the substrate iron two, and then investigated changes of pHs inside the lumen upon iron translocation. And what he discovered that indeed IOT is a ferrous iron proton antiporter that is capable of exploiting the proton gradient that is present in the actual uh, Legionella containing vacuo uh, membrane to actually drive ferrous iron translocation, most likely again an electrochemical gradient, such a way that iron can be enriched in the Legionella cells for replication. So IOT is a ferrous iron proton antiporter and likely a secondary active transporters. And then we went on, I will not go too much in detail because of the reason of time. He also conducted a series of mutation studies of conserved residues, and we were able to identify specific residues that are essential in the transmembrane helices for translocation, either located at the proximity of the host cytosol membrane interface or deeply embedded in the lipid bilayer, or located at the interface between the membrane vacuo and the lumen interface. So overall, the take home message of this study is that we have been able to characterize and identify IOT as a new high affinity, high capacity ferrous iron transporter for iron acquisition in Legionella containing vacuo and both the selectivity, affinity and kinetics matches very well the cytosolic value of the bioavailable iron such a, in the low macromolar range, such a way that these transporters can indeed mediate uh, alone the iron acquisition inside the Legionella containing vacuo and then being uptaken by Legionella for subsequent uh, replication. And this also explains why then the lesion mutants uh, in Legionella genome lacking IROT are actually not violent anymore. Um, I would like to close here, but before I finish, I would like to uh, actually present a few references of the works that we have conducted, conducted in, uh, in our uh, lab on the different areas that I mentioned at the beginning. If you are interested, feel free to just take the references and uh, look uh, at those publications and reach out to me if you have any question. But most importantly, before closing, I want to actually acknowledge and thank the, the work of really a talented group of students that are working under my supervision in the lab. Uh, they are the ones that are on the field doing all the work. I am just advising them. They are a terrific team and all of them, they are working very, very hard, especially during this different time of the pandemic, working in shift seven days a week. And uh, I am really grateful to them because without them, I probably would not be here presenting anything today. And of course, uh, we are collaborating with a number of collaborating collaborators, both uh, at our university and outside uh, UTD, uh, including, including Mexico. And I would like as well to close by acknowledging all the funding agencies that made this work possible, including uh, uh, Context and Conocid that is uh, supporting some of the students uh, coming from Mexico in my lab. And with this, I would like to thank you again for the opportunity and we'd be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Meloni. I have a couple of questions that are in the social media. I, uh, these are about the, uh, our question that is, in several neurodegenerative disease, a loss in metal homeostasis has been identified. In his opinion, the transporter machinery 
fails or how did it may be related to this change in these um, other uh, diseases that uh, are involved in methyl homeostasis? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. It's actually a very interesting and important question. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, I have presented here several examples of bacterial transporters involved in prokaryotic metal homeostasis. Uh, as I mentioned before, in higher eukaryotes, including human be beings, uh, and in particular in very specialized and sophisticated organs like the brain, metal homeostasis is controlled in a very sophisticated and tightly fashion. So the number of metal transporters, just considering, for example, zinc transporters and copper transporters, is very, very high in our brain. And the expression profile of all these, for example, ZIP transporter or uh, ZNT transporters involved in zinc metabolism or CTR and copper pump is actually very sophisticated at titry control. There are a number of neurogen, neuro, neurological diseases that have been associated to either mutation or changes in expression levels of metal transporters that definitely can contribute in alteration of metal levels into the brain. And I am strongly convinced and strongly believe that transporters, as well as storage metalloproteins and chaperones, play a major role in the development of metal dependent phenotypes in several neurologi neurological disorders. Just keep in mind, to give you an example, the two copper pumps that we have in, in humans that are belonging to the P type ATPase family that I discussed at the beginning. Uh, that are ATP7A and ATP7B are causing two disorders that are genetic disorder called Mencken's and Wilson disease that are related to actually copper uh, metabolism. One is basically uh, resulting in copper load, overload and other in, the other in copper deficiency. The one that are responsible for copper overload, one of the main uh, pathological hallmarks are actually neurological uh, uh, phenotypes. So this really uh, revealed that defects in metal transporters that basically result in alter metabolism of metal in the central nervous system indeed are very important for the development of neurological diseases. Thank you so much. I have other question regarding the selectivity in the transporters compared to those that are not. There is some main factors that has been identified, for example, the nature of the residues or the esoteric conditions, or is a combination of both or what happens? Yes, yes. It's uh, obviously for reason of time, I did not really go too much into detail. And I, I have to admit that I sometimes simplify a bit too much or a, a lot uh, for, for clarity reason. I think that, you know, here, in particular in metal pumps, there are several factors that are determining the selectivity. I focus on the transmembrane metal binding site, the high affinity trans transmembrane metal binding site, because that is one of the main um, factor or site of control for selectivity. So that selectivity implies the nature of the ligands, so the nature of the atoms that are coordinating, the position of those atoms, and the relative distance, the plasticity at the transmembrane metal binding site, and the actual coordination, geometry, and environment. That said, beyond that, we have also contribution of other residues that are in the second sphere of coordination, and as well residues that are present in the so-called entry site that allow metal uptake from the cytosol to the high affinity transmembrane site. In other words, for the copper pump, and I probably might go back uh, to that slide. I will do it in a sec if I manage. So when I presented the copper pump over here, so I told you, oops, 
that essentially we generate this psi affinity metal binding site in which you have an ideal site for copper one with a trigonal coordination by sulfur residues. So that is very important for determining selectivity. But another important point is, for example, this methionine over here that is actually sitting here at the interface is not directly responsible in the high affinity binding, but is actually responsible for selection of the metal upon the chaperone is docking at the interface. So that residues in the chaperone, the copper is bound in a digonal fashion by two cysteine. This methionine can then kick in in the coordination environment to generate a transient trigonal site that then allows a series of ligand exchange react reaction to then trigger the delivery to the high affinity site. Indeed, if you mutate this methionine, the copper pump is not working anymore. So if you will, you also have additional residues that are important for allow the pump to be selective for that specific metals that are contributing to the selectivity. The other point that I brought up is the difference between metals uh, selection in pumps compared to ion channels. Ion channels, typically they have a much more static selectivity filters. They do not undergo dramatic conformational changes. And the actual selection is basically, basically, basically more based on a size selectivity. You have an ion like potassium coming in that is coordinated with water. In the selectivity filter, you have oxygen atoms that basically need to displace the water. And that displacement can take place in an energetically favorable manner only if the actual oxygen potassium, for example, distance is actually correct. And uh, that is more a type of size selectivity and energetic base selectivity that is slightly different than the one in the copper pump. Thank you so much. I have a, a, a final question. I don't know if you have um, studies about the thermodynamics, uh, what happens with the um, entropy and health enthalpy, how is um, in these cases playing? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, we have not done, beside determination of binding affinities, we have not done a really detailed analysis of uh, the thermodynamic, in particular, entropy and entropy contribution. This will require uh, ITC study, I use the term titration calorimetry studies that we are actually to plan to do down the road because we would like really to really study more what are the entropic and entalpic entropy contribution that are allowing binding and selection. And especially we would like to make a comparative studies between different classes with different selectivity to see if we have a general principle that is conserved throughout the family or if each subtype use a different modality for the selection of the metal. Thank you so much, Dr. Meloni, to this uh, to accept this invitation. I want to have the congratulations for your job and thank you for here in our conference. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate and wish you the best of luck and stay safe during these challenging times.